All right. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. And welcome to our webinar today, Powering Product Success Through User Feedback. Uh, this is Michael Peach, Head of Product Marketing here at Pendo. I'm very excited to have with us today a uh, special guest, uh, Juan Lopez, who is the VP of User Experience from Validately, uh, and our own John Cutler. Uh, here today, Senior Product Manager at Pendo, uh, where we're going to talk about how to build product functionality that is more valuable, discoverable, learnable, and efficient through better user testing. Um, we want this very much to be an interactive session, uh, so you'll see at the bottom of the screen you've got a little Q&A window. Uh, please, as we're going through the session, if you have any questions, something you don't understand, something you'd like to ask the presenters, Please load it in. We've got some time set at the end of the presentation where we will specifically uh, address your questions. Uh, so with that said, I think we are ready to go. Uh, let me uh, hand it off to Juan to get things started. Juan, thank you for joining us, and over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I hope everyone here can hear me well. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, so my name is Juan Lopez. I'm the VP of User Experience here at Validately. Validately is a user research platform. Um, it does everything from unmoderated to moderated mobile, web, and native app testing. Um, and it's been a great ride while I've been here at Validately. Uh, and, you know, I, it's really, <clears throat> um, I really get to, to design my own product for me and for all other user researchers that are customers. And it, it's really great. Um, so, a little background. I've been doing UX and product for over eight years. And um, <clears throat> I've worked for, for global 100,000 person companies down to you know, small nonprofits and, and startup companies. Um, and so the, the last eight years, has, has, I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope I can just you know, give you guys listening in just a little bit of uh, additional like, kind of tips and tricks and some real best practices. So we're about to get we're about to get to that now. So I'm going to cover two areas. Um, first, best practices on moderated research. Uh, also about effectively scaling user testing programs. So I'm going to get started here with best practices for moderated research. Uh, <clears throat> so first, just a quick quote that I, I really like. Um, I'll read this. So your UI is your product's humble compensation for being, for not being telepathic. Um, it's really important that, you know, we understand that um, your product and your interface and, you know, we can only know so much, right? We can only know our customers and our, our potential customers so well. Um, a product and software just is just not telepathic just yet. Um, so what's really important is to understand your customers at a deeper level, more than just you know whatever you can put on a on a website and what you can put in in a user interface. Um, and so, with that said, I really that's really where I want to go next in the next section is um, really how to understand your users better, um, specifically through moderated research. So I have some some top level sections here. Um, first, I want to just get this one out the way. Um, no matter what you are, what type of role you do, especially if you're a researcher, just know your tools. It's really important um, that you know the ins and outs of your tools. You know, if you're a carpenter, you damn well sure know how to use a, a hammer and whatever other tools carpenters use. Um, so researchers, you use, if you use uh, notes, if you use uh, web conferencing software, if you use uh, screen sharing tools, know them in and out. Uh, the last thing you want to do is start a session, start conducting research with someone, with a participant, participant that you've recruited and you're about to pay for, for their time, and, and waste any of your time doing troubleshooting or technology startup or any of that. Just, this is really, really important. Things will go wrong. Um, and so you want to make sure you know your tool so that the technology in this case gets out the way. What you really are striving for is the insight and research you get from your users 
and obviously not about how to use the tools um, uh, to, to troubleshoot and to do tech, to do tech problems. So <clears throat> just wanted to get that out of the way. So next, uh, along the same, along the same vein, make sure that you're practicing. Um, uh, I'm sure this quote came from somewhere from, from some man or woman, very smart one day who said, remember to test the test, right? So as researchers, um, we have the opportunity to, to practice, to test the thing we're going to test. Um, how do you do that? So a few different ways, but of course, practice internally. Uh, don't jump into a, se a research session without before, before conducting that session with, some, with one of your teammates or with a coworker uh, you know, down the hall. Make sure you've gone through the session um, multiple times. Um, you, that you practice the technology, especially. Make sure you are conducting dry runs. Um, a dry run is more than just, you know, can I open the link? Does it, does it load on my browser? Does it load on my phone? A dry run is, you know, it, an end-to-end, -end, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an end-to-end -end session, um, and it really helps you understand timing. And I guarantee if you run one or two dry runs, you'll find things that you wanna fix of, about your test. Not, not the prototype you're testing, not the website you're testing, just how the flow of the test is gonna be is really crucial. The more you practice this, the easier all the session will be. Lastly here, uh, know, your, know your script, know your task that you're trying to get a participant to run. Um, so, uh, you know, many people, for moderate sessions, you have kind of a, a pretty standard script that you're, you're going to read ahead of time. Um, and then you know the, the specific tasks you want to take your participant through. Just know that like the back of your hand. You know, do not go into it and have to continually refer to your notes, which are likely in some other document, maybe printed on some other window. Um, just make sure you know what you're, what you're trying to get at so you don't waste time doing that. All right, so next section here about is about recruiting. Uh, and so one thing I'll just say first is uh, John from Pendo is going to be talking a lot about this, um, and, you know, he has a lot, a lot of good things to say. So I'll keep it brief here, but two main points. Make sure to recruit more people than you need. Um, if, if you've done research before, you know that no-shows are a given, you know, depending on your industry and time of day and incentive. Um, those are all variables that you can help prevent no-shows, but the truth is they will happen. You do not want to waste your time waiting for someone um, on the phone or during a screen share. Uh, it's, it's, it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of the person that you, you're trying to connect with. You know, just, just get more people than you need. If, if you think you need five people, get seven. Um, you know, there's, no, there's no great rule of thumb here. Um, you know, many people have heard of the, the five to seven rule for usability testing where you get 75 to 80 percent of the usability errors through that if that's the number you're going for five to seven good get eight or or ten people because you're going to have no shows you know and you can easily uh kill that variable during the, the planning phase also really important during the recruiting and kind of scheduling make sure you're giving yourself enough time in between sessions to update your designs or your task or your test that is um, very often you will go through the first two three sessions and immediately you'll get feedback and you'll notice man this this button is no one's noticing this like it's not even close they're not even um, noticing that that section exists so if that's the thing you're trying to learn make an update um, before your next session uh, so what I try to recommend here is you know, if you're going to do three sessions on a Monday, wait for the fourth session till maybe Tuesday morning. So that Monday afternoon, you have time to make a quick update so that the fourth person and beyond are not going through the same errors that the first three are, were pretty obvious. You know, it doesn't happen all the time where the first three give you that kind of um, quick, quick turnaround where you know what kind of design you can make, design change, but it's, it's very often and, and very helpful. All right, two more points on what to do during a, a moderated research session. Um, th these are about during, during the test mostly. 
make sure at the very beginning of the session that your participant, whoever they are, feels comfortable. If they are uncomfortable, if they're answering with, with short answers, if they are giving kind of dodgy answers, um, you know something's going wrong. You have to really take all the re results and insights they provide with a grain of salt. So do your best to you know, make small talk. Make a joke at the beginning of a, of a session. Like try to keep it light. Um, reinforce, and, and, and many people should have this in their scripts, reinforce that nothing they do is wrong. Um, we all know as users, we, we all think like, oh man, why am I doing something wrong? The truth is, especially during usability sessions and research, there is no, nothing that they can do that is wrong. Make sure you reemphasize that and they'll feel more comfortable. Pandas a product that helps product teams improve their user experience. Hey, um, so this is, hey guys, so I'm not sure I'm hearing a, a background conversation if we can make sure we can unmute. Thanks. Our last point here was uh, be open to exploring other areas uh, that come up during a research session that you might not have been looking uh, into, that you might not have been, that might not have been the focus of the research session. Um, you have to be careful. This can turn into uh, a whirlwind and you end up not learning what you wanted to learn. But, you know, give yourself some time. Uh, give yourself a few minutes. If a person really, a current customer especially, kind of has like this passion for explaining this problem that they have, um, kind of give them, you know, give them a few seconds, give them a few minutes. Let them, let them air out their, their grievance if they have one with you, you know. That really, if that really shows you I'm sorry, that really shows them that you're listening and that you're not there just to show them, just to show them the latest thing, but also that um, you're there, you're there to listen and, and there to help, you know, in the long term. Great. Uh, all right. Last section here on the moderated research. Uh, so many people have heard of the five whys. Uh, in summary, the, the more why questions you ask someone, the deeper you get into the real reason that they're having a problem or the real, you know, uh, issue at hand. And I cross out whys here because in moderated research, uh, and maybe in life, <laughs> uh, you have to realize that sometimes the word why can come off as confrontational. Um, you know, think about any time you ever asked someone why something and they respond with, well, why not? Right. So, and that's a good, that's a good response. But in essence, it shows you that sometimes it's kind of like confrontation. It's almost like you're saying, why did you do this as, as if they did it wrong or as if I would have done it a different way. Um, ways, to, ways to solve that error, um, asking very similar questions just without the word why phrased differently. So tell me more about you know, uh, that, that thing. Tell me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what, what on the screen made you do that? You know, why, what made you um, give me that answer? Like, it, you know, it might sound a little superficial, but literally the word why is, is really can be construed by certain people the wrong way and will just provide the wrong, more of a defensive answer than a, a, real, a real insight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, uh, with this is again follows up with the kind of the digging deeper. Many people, many participants will answer in a very kind of short way, right? So yes, no, um, I like it, I don't. Make sure you're following up with those with those kind of questions. Um, you, you're not learning anything if someone just answers in, in that short way. Um, you need to follow up. You know, again, why is why is it okay question sometimes, but mostly. Just find ways to and to get deeper into the to to their problems. Um, and finally, make sure that you know silent pauses will happen. Make sure that you let them happen sometimes. Um, so what you want to do overall is you know you as a researcher want to be listening to a participant talking like you know ninety percent of the session. There are going to be times where they have nothing to say, or at least it seems that way. What you want to do sometimes is. Before you jump in with a follow-up question or the next topic, just give them a few seconds 
And very often they'll provide information that you weren't even looking for, but is, was, is so insightful. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. Uh, very often those, those silent pauses can be, can be more valuable than all the questions you ask. I've, I've had that specific situation myself. Okay, uh, so that was the session section on moderated research. Um, as mentioned by Mike, we'll have Q&A, so if you guys have questions, please ask, and uh, we'll follow up after the, after the two presentations. So next is about effectively scaling user testing and research programs. So first I'll have a, a quick, quick quote here. So uh, another famous person, specifically most deaf, uh, it has a song where he goes, ABC, always be cool. So we, we've heard ABC and, and AB, things like that before, you know, always be closing. Um, what I like to think of is like always be learning. Um, for me, for me, cool means learning. There, there are so many opportunities to learn, to do research, and to create these, these programs and to create these opportunities to learn. So I'm just going to go through a couple examples of uh, where you could do that, where some people might not be doing it now. So first, here's kind of an overall uh, product development cycle uh, a little bit, and also just other opportunities. But just realize that just because some people do testing on prototypes and then some people do testing on live sites and apps, doesn't mean that those are the only opportunities you have to test, right? So here's a list of five different areas and kind of time frames in a product development cycle that you really have opportunities to do some testing or, or research in general. I'll go a little into more detail in the future. I mean, in next slide, but another way to scale your, your research is don't be the, you know, the researcher of one, don't let, don't let, or the product manager of one, don't let you be the bottleneck. Make sure that you're involving your team. One way to do that, um, you know, you have friends in, in the data science and maybe marketing departments, get, be their friend, become even more friendly. They have important data, they have important lists of people that you can tap for research. Um, <clears throat> that's a, a crucial uh, avenue that many researchers do not tackle. Other ways to involve your team, test with them, get their ideas, Go to a whiteboard together. Um, if it's not your team, go down the hall to a coworker who's not on the project but can still provide some sort of insight and another set of eyes. Um, and ask them to, to join a session. Uh, ask them to listen into a, a moderated research session, take notes, um, and, and be part of the process. Uh, when, when, especially developers, when, when developers watch a, a live session, often you know, it might be one of the few opportunities to, to interact or really see live, a live customer, it's, it's such a great insight for, for anyone, but especially with the development team. So involve them, utilize them, um, be their champion, and they will also be, want to be involved in the future. Uh, and I just said that. So make sure you get your team involved all throughout the entire process. All right, so uh, I'm, now I'm gonna go th kind of through those different sections I mentioned. Um, very often, prototype testing, which is hugely important, is thought about as the only time to test. Uh, so I'm going to go through a couple, a couple of these sections real quick. Competitor sites and apps. It really doesn't matter when, what part of the cycle, product cycle you're in. You should always be, if you have a, if you have a strong competitor, do a usability test or do a research session with, with a person who uses those products. It's, again, it's, it's very insightful. You don't use those products necessarily every day. So you will not understand um, the ins and outs and the real features and the real uh, problems that they're solving for your, for your potential customers. So in short, just do it. Just find time. Just do it with one person. Do it with two people. It doesn't matter. Find time to do it. It's really crucial. Okay, N another kind of early part of the process of a product development cycle, um, pre-design interviews. And I write pre-design pre because I, as a UX designer, you know, focus on that. And, um, but product managers often very similar. 
before, you know, you, 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 a team is brought a problem and then they're considered like, all right, well, let's solve this problem. And that's great. Uh, guess what? If you don't, if you haven't talked to a customer, if you haven't heard their problems, if you haven't heard the words out of their mouth, like you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, this does not need to be a, a screen share with a prototype. This could strictly be, I have five questions I want to ask this customer um, and just record the phone call and just get it done. There's no reason that you can't spend one hour or two hours getting a few phone numbers and just talking to, to your customers and understanding and hearing the words that they use and about their, about their problems. Okay. Next section, testing prototypes. I, I mentioned earlier, this is huge. This is, Probably the, the area where you should be spending the most time, most of your time uh, researching and testing. Why? Because anything that you can fix during the prototyping stage is 200 times cheaper to fix now than it is if you were to allow a development team to build, um, put it out into production, and then watch the real world have problems with that. So that's why testing prototypes is huge. Again, a lot of people do this now, so I don't want to talk about this too much. Just find the time to do it um, and iter and don't, don't just use one prototype. Use one prototype, iterate on it, come back to it again, test again with a new prototype. Uh, also crucial here for me that I've seen this happen um, at, at many companies or the lack of it, um, test with pre-production or QA ready code. Don't let, you know, the interact, the, the last iteration of your prototypes be the last time you test before it goes into production. Uh, QA and, and pre-production is often, often has real data or at, or at least very close to real data so that when you do test with a participant, you know, they're not thinking about, oh, well, it says it's John Smith, but I really know my customer is, you know, Mary Jane or, or whatever. Like use the, the ability to test in QA to have the highest level of, of almost real life code, I mean, real life data, sometimes it's real life. And also like, it's really close to the final code. So it, like the, all the interactions, all the final, the final colors, the final words, all that stuff is really close to the end. So you shouldn't spend a lot of time with this because you should be doing a lot of prototype testing before, but there's, it's no reason not to do this another one other time right before the, right before live production. So again, just find time to do it. Like there are going to be excuses. There's no reason you can't find a time to do one or two of these. Uh, and finally, uh, <clears throat> test live websites and your live websites and apps. So this could be after the product, the production, the product development cycle. This could be, you've tested three other uh, parts of the process and that you want to test live here. Again, remember, if you test here and you find a problem, it's going to be really expensive to fix. But depending on the fix or depending on the problem, it might be really important for that V2 version, right? So make sure you're testing live website, your live stuff as well. Um, this might also be an opportunity to test before the next uh, development cycle, right? So maybe you want to do usability tests on a certain area of website before the product team has even decided, hey, we're going to work on this. So testing live websites has real data, it's, you know, it's obviously the live thing. So it's also really crucial to do this as well. Just do it. There, there are no shortage of ways to do this type of testing. Just make sure you get it done. All right, so I, in summary, I talked about how to effectively scale user testing programs um, in the last few slides. And first also about just some best practices for moderated research. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time. If you guys have questions, please uh, put them in a QA and a box um, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and now I want to pass it over to John from Pendo. Great, thanks Juan. Um, just we'll take a second here to make sure our audio levels are good. Okay, it seems like it's good. If, any, if there are any issues with the audio, just uh, put a note in the chat. Uh, my name is John Cutler. I am a senior product manager here at Pendo. Um, just for some background, Pendo is a uh, product that helps other product teams uh, improve their user experience with uh, highly targeted in-app UX, I guess you could call them enhancements, like walkthroughs, polls, surveys, onboarding, overlays. Um, we're data nerds and we're UX nerds at the same time. So um, as a former UX researcher, uh, 
this uh, topic is very near and dear to my heart, so I'm extremely excited to be here. Uh, next slide. Um, so I wanted to start off the conversation here uh, just talking about representativeness uh, and the population. And so earlier on in my career, I was obsessed with sample sizes. I was obsessed with trying to get as many people into um, my usability tests as possible. And uh, I was making a critical mistake at that point, and, and it's a beginner's mistake, and I made it often. And really, when you look at sample size and representative, they're two very different concepts. So you could have a representative sample of five people could be a lot more usable and useful for you as researchers than a non-representative sample of a thousand. And that's critical um, when you're planning your tests. And if you have a feature that's targeting multiple personas, you need to start thinking about things like stratified sampling, where you try to take um, individuals from each of the populations so you have a representative sample. And I, I know in the real world this is difficult, and just getting five people to come to you or use any of the moderated testing tools like Validately, it's difficult. Um, but just try to keep these things in mind. It's, it's better to have an, a slightly imperfect representative sample than to kill yourself trying to get a large sample size. Uh, next slide. So, just speaking from experience here, um, I, I have done B2C recruiting for usability tests. Um, specifically, the last couple years I've been involved in the B2B domain um, in highly specialized applications. And so uh, anyone who's recruited there just knows the pain involved. You have to do uh, long surveys often to identify testers. You have to kind of negotiate and curry favors from other parts of your organization to try to locate um, good participants. And even after all that, what would happen to me is I'd be in a session, um, often you know, you've got six engineers in there who are willing to check out the session, and it's always great to have your engineers in the session. Everyone's waiting, and it turns out that the person isn't really an active user um, in the area of the application you're testing. And you'd have other sessions where you would be trying to test a more advanced feature, and a lot of B2B applications, ramp up does matter. These are complex, um, uh, tools. My the product before I worked on Pendo was about 400 pages and maybe you know uh, 900 or a thousand unique tasks involved in there. So ramp up time really mattered. Um, and in all these tools too, you have this issue of the silent majority. Often, if you go to the same channels in your organization over and over looking for people, you're going to sort of get a skewed sample at that point. And all these applications have what I call the silent majority, um, who you don't really have access to. And so this presents a really big opportunity in terms of reaching out. Next slide. Um, so anyone who's been involved in business to business has heard something like this where someone will say, well, you know, it's B2B. Um, it's very specialized. We, you know, they would cost us $300 per participant if we try to find strangers on the street. And it's an enterprise product. And frankly, they don't care much about UX really. And we've got tons of stuff to build. And you've heard stories like that. And, and, really to, to echo Juan, it's basically excuses. <laughs> We're making excuses for ourselves. Um, even in enterprise B2B applications, UX will often be one of the key uh, drivers for net promoter score, usability, retention, et cetera. And the other thing that you hear, um, and again, Juan alluded to this, is that you call in those favors to marketing. Um, they've, they're pulling some numbers for you. They've got lists, but they've also got a billion other lists. and um, you're just in permanent hold waiting for that list of people. And that's very frustrating for anyone who's been involved in that situation. Uh, next slide, please. So what I wanted to talk about today is using your product data to identify participants. It's really in, in my career, maybe over the last uh, two years, it's really opened up um, how I recruit for tests and made them a lot more effective. But when I say product data, what am I talking about? Um, Here's some considerations. You might think about the participants' prior usage uh, from the session level all the way down to the actual level. If you're optimizing sort for your tables, you might want to find people who have used the current sorting options for your tables, for example. You can also look at their prior completion rates. Let's say you're doing a redesign. How successful was this person in the past? Were they successful? You can look at related features in the product. Is this someone who would be 
a good candidate for this new design that we're working on? Have you looked at their tenure or onboarding stage? This is very, very important in complex B2B products because at some point you have these very eager new customers. Often they're very eager to participate in tests for no money. Um, and they're learning the software. And at that point, um, these are great participants who have not really had time to create all the workarounds in, uh, in your tool. You can look at NPS and satisfaction scores. You could look at detractors or you could look at promoters. How satisfied are they? So I'm taking a very broad scope here in terms of using product data. Um, in other applications, you can look at self-identified role. Um, a lot of our customers use kind of role polls or things that try to have the um, customer self-identify with a persona because we all know that an admin in your system might wear a ton of hats. They might be the manager and the admin the same time. And then things like device, OS, browser usage, and very importantly, the degree of business touch. A lot of times the concern in an organization is that a person has been touched too many times by different departments and that they're getting overwhelmed. So trying to get some sense, if you take this broad view of your product as everything you're doing that touches the customer, trying to understand their business touch level. All these things are things that you can leverage uh, in your recruiting strategies using product data and can make your sessions, your moderated sessions, a lot more effective. It's, it's dollars for everyone to be there often, and so you want to make these very effective. Next slide. When you think about recruiting, um, throughout my career, at a certain point it was just the phone, um, and then we moved on to email, and then we um, sometimes it was in person. I think anyone on the call who's wandered into a Starbucks to do, uh, do some gorilla usability testing knows how that feels. It's kind of fun too. Um, with complex business to business applications and complex consumer, um, you've got a nice core group of people there who've used your app, if that's your goal, right? If you don't want to find someone who's never even touched an application like yours, um, what I would encourage people to do is to leverage all the recruiting channels that you have available. In my previous job, we had a customer advisory panel, and this is something that I think anyone could leverage. What we did is we had a group of about four to 600 users that agreed to get a monthly newsletter where we mentioned what we were recruiting for, and then we asked them to take a pretty in-depth survey, and from there, we would get the group of people to test. Um, it's not perfect. You're missing that silent majority, and I would start to see the same names appear again and again, but this was a free advisory panel. And to be honest, it was great marketing. Um, people love to be part of the usability test. And this was a business application. So a lot of stereotypes about how people view their enterprise applications really don't hold true when you're in the field and doing the work. Lately, I've been focusing on in-app outreach just because there's only so many minutes in the day. It allows me, being sort of very data focused, it allows me to um, target people brace based on product data and not spamming them. Um, and one thing I've, you know, before I would say if I wanted to get a group of 15 people into a test, I needed to start scheduling everyone. I was throwing around time slots. It was an incredibly complex process. I like that Validately is trying to sort of streamline that. That's very, very effective. So what I would do um, in, in, a, in my role here at Pendo is if I have a question, I reach out to a very small group of people. It's better to get 50% of 30 people than to get 10% of 150 people because you don't want to overwhelm these people in your app. The, I have a little screenshot here, but here we have guides in our product and I was saying, hello, guide ninjas. I know you use this feature. I'd love to talk with you about it. I think I filled my 10 person limit with zero work on my part in you know an hour. Um, it was very easy to do and I didn't have to book these people. So consider that the efficiency in your process is a big part of your ability to make this part of your product culture. Next slide. So the other area where product data can be incredibly helpful is in planning your tasks. And this is an underused thing for, for UX folks. We often actually don't have access to the data tools. Um, it's something that we're passionate about here at Pendo, but in general, when we talk to our customers, they've often not had access to an easy to use tool to extract uh, customer data. But when you have access to a tool like that, you can start looking at the existing workflow. Let's say you're trying to replace an existing workflow. What are the high frequency tasks? What are the key outcomes and goals that people are trying to achieve? What were the low frequency tasks? The, sorry, the low frequency but high value tasks. 
And then looking at actual sequences, including things like empty state situations and stuff like that. So what you really notice, um, th this helps you streamline your tasks because you ground the tasks in data. You don't have a lot of time with the participant and their patience level will drop throughout your moderated session. So you really need to focus in on the actual tasks they use and in the order they use it. And that's vital. If you do things out of order, it can often sort of cloud the actual experience. So it's important to try to line up these tasks in, in order. Next slide. Um, just a little story here. I remember, I think any UX researcher has been in um, after a session or maybe you're asked to put the subject on mute and an engineer or an executive would say, um, you know, no one would ever do that. No one would ever do it. This test is so unnatural. They're nervous. The test is flawed. Uh, there's no way that someone would be dumb enough. And they will use words like that. And it's really hurtful if you're into UX. You hear words like that. No one would be dumb enough to do it that way. So I can guarantee you, if you go to the next slide, oh, really? As you start to look at data, you understand that there is a happy path. And we think about the happy path as designers, interaction designers, service designers, etc. As you look at this data, users rarely follow that ideal path through your application. Very, very rarely. And I'd say that more broadly for your UX team, hopefully you're a cross-functional team, you're working all together, is getting your UX team um, involved with looking at the paths of people through your product. There's various products that do it, and I've used a lot in the session recordings, stuff like Pendo, other things. Google Analytics, whatever, I'm a tool junkie, so use the tools that you have, but try to build empathy through the data and not force data onto people as if that's the absolute truth. Um, using the data allows people to see that people veer off the happy path all the time. What this lets you do in your session is, if you have someone doing something odd that you're questioned about later, just refer to the data and let the stakeholders know, you know, in fact, that's very representative of people, what people were doing on this page. And that's a key factor. Next slide. So I wanted to end here um, just taking a step back. Juan and I spoke about this a little bit before the, uh, before the talk, but ideally what you're doing is you're establishing your recruiting criteria as a core component to your feature. I don't care if you want to call it a specification or a story or uh, you know, a journey, whatever you wanna do there, there is a who involved, there is a target. And that's whose behavior will change because of this work. This is a very simple framework I've used with teams and it's whose behavior will change because of the work. That is your target. And then you have to think, how will we intervene? So something in the world will change because of your design. And usually it's some aspect of their current behavior. And this is when working with prototypes, doing qualitative interviews, doing semi-structured qualitative interviews where you might tag the interview responses quantitatively um, to understand trends there. What is their current behavior? Look at product data, understand. And then what is your hypothesis on how, you'll, how their behavior will change? So that's your intervention. And then finally are the outcomes. How will the new behavior benefit the user? And how will the new behavior benefit us, the business? And assuming that you're you know, in a, in a for-profit business or even a nonprofit or any organization. So where this ties the parts of the talk together is if you define that, that target early, then it can become socialized throughout your project and you're not rushing right at the end of the game to try to establish your recruiting criteria at the last minute. First of all, there's a little bit of bias involved there. You kind of start recruiting people based on who you think the design will appeal to versus who you in, in originally intended the design to appeal to. So try to establish those criteria early, use your product data to benchmark their current behavior, plan your interventions, start testing, testing, testing early and often, prototypes, whatever you can get your hands on, and then measure to, to Juan's point at the end, measure that that outcome is actually being achieved, both in your usability test through task completion, et cetera, and then once that feature has been released. It, the quote, there's often a quote that to fix a feature that's out there is a lot more expensive, but if you think about the grand scheme, the engineering and R&D budget features cost a ton more than just your engineering budget. Um, if they can impact all parts of your organization from marketing, who markets a feature that's a dud, to support who has to support a feature that's a dud. It's not just engineering rework. 
it's your whole organization that has to suffer when you release a feature that doesn't quite um, hit the mark. You might as well eliminate the feature if it's not really meeting the mark. That would probably save you money in the long run to do that. So I wanted to close on that slide with a quick, um, with a quick recap, the final slide. Um, in closing, so obsess about representativeness. Become really good at representativeness as UX researchers, and the sample size questions will go away because your tests will be effective and representative. Um, no excuses, easier said than done, obviously, um, but try to at least advocate for these types of tests. Um, try to make regular testing a product development habit, and that means integrating product data, whatever you can do to mean this is something you do every Thursday morning, um, or something that you do every two weeks, Stop making the whole process of usability testing such a big affair, which it often is, and disruptive for your team. You just have to make it the regular heartbeat for your team. And then finally, really consider the idea of data-driven personas. Um, I have gone to teams that were highly skeptical of personas, smart, smart engineers, rightfully highly skeptical of personas, and we were able to build data-driven personas, and they started to use the names of the personas. They started to call them by name. Um, they were highly engaged in that persona, and that extended through the usability testing when they would say, hey, we're testing a Margaret today. That's super exciting. Um, so that was really, really powerful when you can make that happen. Let that product data drive who you recruit, and then on to establishing the tasks for your test. Um, so that's uh, all I have for today. Um, I guess we'll throw it back to Mike uh, to field some questions, and uh, thanks for the opportunity for chatting with you today. Great, thanks so much. One, thank you, John. Um, really great session today, and I'm starting to see a number of questions come in, which is really fantastic. Um, and we've got plenty of time, hopefully, to address all of them. Um, so we'll start. I think this is one that, that probably both John and Juan could could comment on. Uh, and the question is: uh, Any tips regarding research around non-public products? Uh, for example, I work on commercial products internally. I find a lot of research tips to be focused on things like apps for a million users, but not really for products that are catered to a smaller group. And I, I think we probably touched on that a little bit anyway. Um, but Juan, let me throw it over to you first. How would, how would you, what would you recommend for a situation like that? I'm, <clears throat> it's a good question. I'm not sure, uh, you know, you should be thinking of it all that differently. Um, I think to, to John's point, you shouldn't be designing any one feature, especially at that level, for a million people, right? You, you should be testing, you should be building something to solve a very specific persona's problem. So the more specific a problem, a, a persona, to me, it sounds like it, it really gets closer to that question, right? So it's not, it's not for, it's not Google, it's not search for the world. Um, you know, in essence, it's, it's similar to Val Daily. We are not designing um, anything consumer focused. This is B2B for user researchers. Um, you know, it's pretty niche. Um, the fact that I can't go on LinkedIn and find, you know, a million user researchers makes my job a little easier, right? I, I can focus on the right people. Um, I'm not, there was also another aspect of that question, which might not might not have been what I what how it came off, but this is how I understood it. Um, if you do if you do want to test on things that are non-public, uh, you know you want to keep things, you want to keep URLs, you want to keep access, um, you want to restrict access to like maybe things that you're testing. Maybe it's a stealth startup. Maybe it's a prototype you want no one to see. Um, there's also there are ways to do that. Um, for example, a uh, validately. Validately, when, when we uh, when you put up a prototype, the the tester or the participant has no does not need to see the access to the URL that you're you're hosting. Um, again, I'm not sure if that was a, the actual question, but it sounded like there was a part of that there too. So um, yeah, so that's my answer. Okay, John, cool. John, anything to add to that? Yeah, not 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 much to add. I think that the question more, like I said, is with non-public sites for testing existing functionality. Um, if you have customers coming in already, one, if you need people who have never seen the app before, you can sometimes get involved with prospects. Very early in the onboarding stage or very early, you might be able to get people who are very new to your application. And like I said, in some ways, it's an opportunity. I kind of echo Juan's thing that I, I don't really, um, 
I, I've never really struggled once I've put my mind to it to have access to existing customers in that type of situation. Um, the worst thing you can have is a situation in your company where there is a long chain of permission that needs to be asked to be able to pick up a phone and call someone. Focus on that problem first, and then these other things start to unfold. I do have to say though, when you have a private you know, B2B type product like that that people don't have access to, finding someone who fits the exact buying persona but who has never seen the product can be challenging. And I, I'd actually say um, collaborating with sales can be, infect, uh, be effective. Um, they are um, out there prospecting and have located groups of people. So if it's a highly specialized app, you can use their existing sort of validation of deals to try to locate people. I hope that was the answer to your question, but I see it as an opportunity. Um, maybe it was a more technical question to Juan's point, but hopefully we, um, we helped answer it. Cool. Um, all right, so next question, this one is for Juan. Um, pretty simple, but I think it's, it's a good one. It says, if, if you were just starting out now with UX testing, um, what would you do differently? Like if you, could, if you could start from scratch today in your UX testing, maybe what would you change? From my current process, <laughs> this is a tough, this is a tough question. Uh, I think okay, so I'll go back. You know, a few years now, um, where I where I when I did start, uh, most of my focus around testing was on unmoderated remote testing, um, and so the the idea was. You know, I know I need to, I want to get my customers or users to, to go from tap from this, to complete a task from, you know, a, maybe start on page A and get to page D or whatever. Um, you know, maybe it's complete a purchase on a, in the shopping cart or something. Um, and so I would, I would take a lot of time, uh, draft a test, a test plan, you know, ask, set up all the task questions, um, you know, spell them out the way I needed to, to make sure it wasn't a biased, it wasn't a biased test that I wasn't leading on. I wasn't leading my, my customers or users. Um, and I would spend a lot of time doing that. And, you know, maybe a Friday afternoon, I would let it, let it go live and hope, hope that Monday morning I got back and I had, you know, five or 10 responses. Um, I'd say the, the biggest change I would make now is, um, I'd focus on the right persona. Again, I think this is going to be a recurring theme. Make, making sure I'm, I'm hitting the right target. And then I'd rather talk to five people live on the phone um, doing a moderated session and get, try to get the same output, right? The same, the in, same insight about could they complete the task and, um, and their, their thought process throughout. But being able to talk to, the, to individuals live, you, again, you get to follow up, you get to dive much deeper um, that's something that if, I guess if I could go back, I would change. Okay, cool. Um, next one here is for John. Um, well, this is actually a pretty good one. Uh, John, how do you, how do you determine if a sample is representative? You pray. I'm just kidding. Um, so I think, uh, let, let me just even start higher level on that question. So first of all, when you're dealing with five individuals and you're coming up with some feature that you think will have broad impact across your application, um, I, I wouldn't suggest going completely overboard with every test worrying at that scale of, of, of representative. But really what you need is you need to know your customers and you need to know your segments as they exist right now. You need to have a very clear sense of how you would naturally segment your customers. And that's kind of the prelude to being able to even think about representativeness. So if someone worries about representativeness but then doesn't have access to the information or data to know what the population looks like, um, that's, uh, that's difficult. So to start thinking about representativeness, start thinking about the key variables that you think that will exist. So um, 
you know, device usage and what device they normally use may not be important for 95% of the things that you work on, right? But if you're working on something that's mobile specific, it obviously is important. So very simply, I'll create a, five, a list of the five things that you think will highly impact how this feature turns out for people. And then um, look at your persona and then try to compare that with the whole population. So without, I, mean, I don't want to, we could talk for an hour about it, but that's in short what it is, is you have to have a keen awareness of what your population looks like. So spend a lot of time slicing and dicing your whole population and then that will make it easier. So a quick example, if at any given time, 30% of your users are new, you're maybe in like a rapidly growing, here at Pendo we're rapidly growing, we're having a lot of new users, at any time that happens, I know that the feature I have will need to involve 30% uh, new people because that's my population at the moment. So a long, a long topic, but I'd be happy to talk with you at some later point too. You could tweet to me and we could uh, get in touch. Good, I think, um, I think this one is actually a quick reaction to something that you said, John. Um, what is the empty state situation? Oh, what's Question the, from the audience. Oh, what's the empty? It's an existential place that we all spend as, as product folks when we don't know what to build next. Just no, that's, that's not what the empty state thing is. It's a, um, the empty state problem is you have an application that is supposed to be filled with data. And um, this is why we focus on onboarding here a lot of Pendo, but like you imagine you get into your application and you have no objects there. Um, I was on with a customer the other day and he was wondering, I, I really, don't, really don't know why they're not responding to this. And I said, well, what do 90% of your users experience during their onboarding phase when they get to this page? And he said, oh crap, they haven't created a project yet. So all this sort of messaging that I put in here to try to get them to edit their projects or do things like that didn't relate. So the empty state problem is a state where the objects in your system, like people, projects, accounting things, um, have not been populated yet, and so it's not clear what's happening. Um, settings haven't been made, anything like that. And that's a good opportunity at that point to try to, you know, urge the user to create those objects um, to start making the application usable. So that's the empty state problem. Thanks, John. Um, one, uh, we'll give this one to you, um, which is, I, I, I don't know if there's a hard and fast answer here, but um, I got a good question. What sort of compensation is typical for testers? Uh, and should people who are doing user testing expect and plan for some kind of way to compensate the people that are doing testing for them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, ask any researcher and they'll say it depends, so I'll say that too. But to give you some details, um, you know, just, just for an example anyways, uh, if you run if you run an unmoderated test um, unvalidately, it's a you know the it's ten dollars um, the participant gets for like a short you know five to ten to fifteen minute session. Um, so you know that tells you that at some point there there are that many people who are willing to do those type type of tests for you. Um, now unmoderated panel tests are a very specific type of test, so I'll stay away from that for now. the the other The other thing you need to know is. And John mentioned it. Um, there are going to be times where incentives not even necessary. There are going to be time. There are going to be people, customers or potential customers, who can't wait to try out new things. And if you don't mention a dollar figure, they they have no problem. They're like, yeah, I'll, I'll spend thirty minutes of my time talking to you. Um, and if you think about it, that's also a pretty strong indication of how valuable the thing that you're working on is. Um, so I'm not saying to to be cheap and never pay anyone. But really, it's to me the incentive is a variable that you play with to incre to decrease your no shows, um, as well as to understand uh, at some to some degree like how how strong of a problem that you're solving for certain people. Um, you know, again, like it, it really depends if you're trying to, if you're building stuff for for a lawyer or someone in a in a law firm, their time is is unbelievably expensive. So. You, you know, I can't tell you like, oh, $30 for a 30 minute session is great. Um, it really, really depends on the type of person you type of recruit, you're trying to recruit. Um, you know, if you, uh, many, many product teams, researchers recruit off Craigslist. If you're, if that's the type of target person you're going for and you know, it's super extremely helpful, you can probably get away with like 
fifteen dollars for a thirty minute session, or or maybe thirty dollars per session. You, it's very possible, but it's not about the dollar amount. It's more about what you're trying to get out of it. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thanks, Juan. Um, another question here. We got a time for for just a couple more. Um, and, and this, I think, is in response to some of your stuff, John. Um, mm -hmm. A question here that says, "How do you define personas, or how do you target personas via in-app outreach, or how do you know you're reaching your target persona when you're doing in-app outreach?" Um, good question. I mean, it's very near and dear to the product we have, so I'm going to try to like build our product out of it, but. Um, you obviously need to have access to the data and then you need to have some ability to segment that those customers out. So um, I'll just describe in our product because it's easiest to do. In our particular product, you would create, you're, you're pulling a lot of that data in. You can pull data in from Salesforce. You can pull data from their behavior. You can pull data from a lot of places, from survey results that the customers themselves fill out. Um, we have a segmentation capability that, that lets you um, locate that particular group of customers through a set of rules, like how long have they been in the app, et cetera. And then from there, you're able to target um, the particular uh, in-app messages. One thing I would say, very, if, however you do it, target, 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 target. We, we have customers who come in who talk about having maybe a three or 5% interaction rate with a piece of um, in-app messaging. And, and I tell them immediately, just stop. Stop. You need to target because if the best interaction rates we have are, you know, 50, 70, 80 percent, it's it's amazing. It, you know, it can be like 3x or 5x more because it's targeted. That little hello guide ninjas thing that I put up there, it would mean nothing to a new user who would come in and, and that would be spam. It would basically be spam in your app. So before, you never want to spam users in your app it's the worst thing you can do so it's better we have different things that you can maybe like ramp up on a sample or something but start small test try it to expose it to 50 people see if you're getting 20 30 plus percent response rates and if you are expand it. and if you aren't you're probably not targeting it enough and if you end up talking to the wrong people obviously you're using the wrong variables to begin with cool um, so I think we got time. We'll do uh, one more here, and, and Juan, I'll let you run with this one. Um, we got a question about sort of different demographics. So, um, you know, are there any considerations that that someone should think about if they're working on a, a younger demographic, say maybe like children aged 11 to 17, or um, senior citizens, for example, as a demographic? Um, you know, if you're designing software for those segments, are there some additional considerations that you should work in, both from understanding your audience as well as a recruitment perspective? That's a good question. Uh, I, may, I may let the recruitment part on John. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, I'll, honestly, I'm inexperienced in either of those demographics. Um, what, I'll, what I'll say is from being at Validately and learning a lot from the customers who use us for research um, is that uh, specifically the younger demographic is really hard to target. Um, uh, you know, so don't quote me on this because I really don't, I don't have a lot of detail here, but in essence, just the fact that, you know, you always have to have a parent involved if they're under 18, um, it makes it incredibly difficult um, to do, especially to do like sort of remote stuff, um, again, without having a parent involved. Um, I know I've heard of examples of kind of uh, younger children apps and things where a researcher will go, would kind of do more ethnographic research and go to a school and, you know, ensure that, that a teacher or principal or someone like that is involved and they know exactly what's going on. Uh, you, you don't want to tell them um, that kind of information uh, early and, and be clear. Um, but that really, that kind, of, that kind of tactic helps in that scenario. If it's not, a, even if it's not a school app, you might have access to, to children like that. Um, uh, again, don't take my word on it directly. That's kind of what I've heard, um, and I know it's, it's worked to some degree. Um, yeah, and on the on the demographic, on the I'm sorry, on the recruitment side, uh, honestly, I, I'd let uh, John respond if he has something to say. Just the one thing I will say is, um, recruiting recruiting is not 
difficult. You have to know who you're trying to recruit for. You have to find the kind of the places they are, right? So example, children are in a school, you'll find a lot of them. Um, senior citizens, you know, for lack of a better term, maybe they're in a lot of senior homes and you can find um, access to, to, to certain homes that might give you access to things like that. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I hope that answered a little bit. Maybe, John, if you have any final words on that. No, I mean, just to echo what you said, I used to work at Nickelodeon and um, you're, it, it was very much going on site where parents could be your parent or teachers could be. Um, but there were some of the most fun sessions and most fun interactions I've, I've ever had. One thing that I would remark about a, a more senior population is they, they if uh, assuming that they're retired, not that they necessarily need to be retired, but um, my, my father, for example, is 81 and he just told me the other day that he had participated in an online focus group and then the next day he said he was using his computer while someone watched for something um, and uh, yeah, I was blown away myself. So apparently there are, there are ways to contact the, that group of people. Um, maybe you could follow up with me and I'll follow up with my dad. Yeah, we've, ha we've had uh, some dads involved in research. <laughs> Let's hope so. All right. Well, we are now um, actually just a few minutes over time. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for all the interaction and the questions. Um, I know there's a couple that we didn't get to answer, which we will uh, circle back with you guys offline uh, with responses. Everyone who uh, joined us today, we will send out um, a recording of the webinar uh, shortly after we wrap up here today, so you should get that shortly. Um, Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, appreciate your time and your participation. Thanks, everyone.